Ten years ago, Ariana Grande burst onto the pop scene with her debut record, Yours Truly. Since then, she has carved a thrilling career shifting between genres, evolving from an ex-Nickelodeon star to one of modern music's defining divas. In this video, we'll talk about her underrated first proper studio album, which I think laid a very strong foundation for Ariana's pop career and finding her footing as a solid R&B staple. You know the drill, we'll discuss the history of the era, the music itself, and then I'll give it a score. The rise of Ariana Grande. Grande, the daughter of a communication equipment CEO and a graphic design business owner, always seemed to be destined for success. Even at the age of eight, she was performing the national anthem at home games for her local hockey team. Grande eventually found her footing in theater, even playing the lead role of Annie as a child at one point. Grande's love for the R&B genre has always been there. At 14, she told her very first managers that she wanted to record an R&B album. At just 15, Grande landed the role of Charlotte in 13 the musical on Broadway. It was there that she'd meet her eventual co-star Elizabeth Gillies. Grande and Gillies were eventually cast in Nickelodeon's hit series Victorious, a star vehicle for Victoria Justice and one of the 2010's tween television staples. This show centered around a group of performing arts high school students and had a few songs chart in the Hot 100. Grande starred as the ensemble dark horse fan favorite Cat Valentine, a role she actually consistently dyed her hair red for. Cat was a somewhat lovable sweet dummy who contrasted Gilly's tough as nails Jade and Justice's dramatic and messy home wrecking Tory. Grande and Gilly's were given a chance to show their skills in season one on the song Give It Up, a song sung during the Freak the Freak Out episode. When she wasn't filming on the show, she would post these covers of songs on YouTube. My best friend in middle school would show me all of these impressive covers that she had and we both wondered why she didn't have her own show or record. It turns out that Monty Lipman, founder and CEO of Republic Records thought so too. A close friend of his actually forwarded her channel to him and he signed her. To this day, Grande remains one of Republic Records' biggest artists. Even before signing to Republic, Grande had been working on her debut record, then rumored to be named Daydreaming. Her first proper song with Republic, Put Your Hearts Up, dropped at the end of 2011 and, well... <laughs> Put Your Hearts Up was a sweet bubblegum pop track about love changing the world, which sampled What's Up by Four Blondes. It hit gold certification, it did not chart. Grande herself would go on to say in later interviews that she did not want to release the song. In one 2014 Rolling Stone interview, she called it the worst moment of her life, noting the bad spray tan, the princess dress, and joking that she'd have nightmares about it. At one point, she even had the label hide it from her Vivo page. Eventually, she would soften her stance in 2020, saying that it had been made for fans of the cat persona and how it would have been a better fit for an artist pursuing bubblegum pop. Finding a new direction. Grande used the single's underperformance to get Republic to give her more creative control over the record. After four seasons, Victorious would abruptly end for unknown reasons. Just one month after its finale, Grande would release The Way with Mac Miller, the real lead single off Yours Truly. This song marked a more mature direction for Grande, presenting her as a proper artist rather than an ex-actor. It was critically acclaimed, debuted in the top 10, making her the first female artist in the 2010s to make her first appearance on the Hot 100 in the top 10. The song had longevity. It charted for half a year. It would re-peak at 9 due to strong radio demand. Grande was off to a hot start with a summer smash. A follow-up single, Baby Eye, was released in July. The song hit 21 on the charts and really earned her even more street cred with reviewers, noting it as an improvement over the way, which they loved already. Many noted the sophistication of her vocals and drew favorable comparisons to Mariah Carey and other big 90s icons. In August, Ari released the album cover, though fan backlash would lead her to change it to the iconic black and white cover we have today. Now revived 10 years later for the anniversary reissue. In a retrospective interview, Grande said that her fans bullying her worked. Grande also revealed that she changed the album's name from Daydreaming to Yours Truly because she felt like this was a love letter and introduction to the world. Two final singles came before the album, Right There with Big Sean, which felt like a sequel to The Way of Sorts and Almost Is Never Enough, a soulful duet with Nathan Sykes featured on the would-be franchise starter City of Bones' soundtrack. Both peaked in the 80s region of the charts, but received positive reviews. The album debuted on August 30th to general acclaim. Critics praised it for its fresh sound, Grande's powerful vocals, and its clever use of nostalgia. 
Yours truly debuted at number one, beating sales projections with 138,000 units sold. One thing to note that a strong majority of those sales were digital copies, which I argued foreshadowed her future success as a streaming powerhouse. To support the album, Grande did a modest tour called The Listening Sessions, which sold out on all dates and even caused Ticketmaster to take down pre-sales. It was meant to expand due to its demand, but because of contractual duties to Sam and Cat and work on her second album, they scrapped it. Ten years later, today, Grande would repackage this album for a 10th anniversary edition with six re-recorded tracks live from London. Fan favorite and opener Honeymoon Avenue's production was tweaked to resemble the demo for the track with a more doo wop sound. Grande's re-recordings took place in London due to her involvement in the upcoming Wicked movie where she will play the iconic Glinda the Good Witch. Okay, now it's time to talk about the music because I love this album's music. In hindsight, Yours Truly is a well-machined R&B record anchored by Ariana's talent and a strong set of producers and writers. Ariana actually has a few writing credits on this and even vocally produced The Way, but really let two key producers shepherd the record's sound, Harmony Samuels and the R&B legend Kenneth Babyface Edmonds. Also noteworthy was the Rascals who would return to work on position seven years later. Yours Truly is a mostly cohesive record that thematically touches on the ups and downs of romance through the lens of 50s and 90s pop nostalgia. It really did stand out from the crowded 2010s electro dance pop hits of the time. I love those, but this really did give Ariana some room to really differentiate herself from her peers. The more analog and almost organic sounds of this record really felt fresh, and I recall one of the biggest comparisons she got at the time was Mariah Carey, something that she actually considered the greatest compliment in the world. Grande had ironically covered Carey's iconic song Emotions a year before yours truly. When I first heard this record, I was actually thinking more of a Christina Aguilera vibe, just based on them having similar histories as former TV idols. And the very subtle sass that they have. Sonically, the record also contains splashes of 1950s piano doo pop. Roughly one third of the record contained features, most of which I thought were effective, although I felt popular song featuring Mika felt out of place. Even in hindsight, it's kind of funny because it did sample popular from Wicked, which predicted Ariana's future role. The album starts with Honeymoon Avenue, a thrilling opener about a romance that's clearly exiting the honeymoon stage and is on the brink of utter disaster. The narrator of the song still has hope and wishes to go back to the way things were, which feels like a fun meta commentary on why this record's sounds like a rewind. I actually found this really sad interview where Grande elaborated that she had written the song when she was in a relationship that made her so sad, which explains why the album version is very somber compared to the demo and live version, which has a more upbeat Motown sort of beat. Both versions are lovely, but I really do prefer the up-tempo one just a bit more because I remember hearing that snippet on Snapchat years ago and waiting a year for her to put it on SoundCloud. Baby Eye was my favorite single. Babyface's production really evokes the sound of the time that Destiny's Child, Mariah, Aaliyah really ruled the world. My mom is a huge R&B fan the way that I am a pop stan today. She would always play their records all the time, so this track really clicked with the nostalgia for me. The lyrics cover a crush that has he's so tongue-tied that you can't really tell them. Ari's vocals really sell that overwhelming feeling so well. There's a fun sample of that THX deep note, the horns, the drums, it's very much summertime bottled into a song. And honestly, I think had she released it now, it, I think it would actually chart pretty well today. The music video is so cute too, it deserved better. Right there with Big Sean is a solid track. The track really reminded me of Mariah's Always Be My Baby. It really feels like a time capsule. The snare drums, the synths that really punctuate Grande's vocals. I also felt like Big Sean actually used his time pretty well on the track, but the structure of the song really makes it for me. I'm a huge sucker for structure. The uh, pre-chorus leading to the chorus, which really showcases her vocals and her devotion to the subject that she's singing about. The catchy refrain of You Got It Babe really being that locked in final layer that keeps you in the song. I'd actually been reading Romeo and Juliet in class when the video had dropped, so I really loved that video. Her videos for this era are very lo-fi and casually cool. Tattooed Heart is a standout for me. The emotion and the vocal 
vocals and the lyrics and the clean production just make it magical. Ari revealed in her Q&A that she had written the song by herself at 17, and it really does feel like the most personal track on this album. It has that classic 1950s sound to it. The lyric, I want to say we're going steady like it's 1954, adds to that feeling. The bridge itself is my favorite part because the escalation in vocals is amazing. I remember her performing it at the AMAs one year. It was just a really magical performance. Loving It is an earworm that samples Mary J. Blige's Real Love, something that I didn't really know when I first listened to it. There's a sweet, breezy back and forth energy on this. Ariana almost floats on this production effortlessly. There's so many hooks in the track and the bridge switch up really makes this an underrated gem. Those fluttery ad-libs towards the end are really great. Piano was one of my favorites at the time of the album's drop. It's just this really uplifting, soulful little bop. Sure, the verses are actually exactly the same, like, but she sings it so well that you don't even notice. The chorus itself is such a joyful earworm. I really felt like it was a fun fusion of the 90s and 50s sounds that she was going for. Daydreaming is the next track, and I definitely get why it was almost a title track, from its dreamy, floaty production to its adorable lyrics and the vocal performance on here. It's a very realized concept. The harsh synths that clash with the piano create this fun, trippy sound that captures the feeling of being on the brink of snapping out of a daydream. At the very end of the track, we actually get a really cute short clip of her grandparents discussing how they met. The Way with Mac Miller remains one of her seminal tracks for a reason. The track itself is very interesting because it had been written for Jordan Sparks, but Ari really just owns it. Mac's present on the track really elevates it. I remember his rap just as well as Ari's parts, actually. It's such a romantic track, and the chemistry that they had on it really elevates it to a classic collaboration. I think that this track, sounding so mature but so playful, did wonders, really helping the general public take Grande seriously. Around that same time, I recall Miley was shaking Disney off with bangers and Selena Star's dance hinted at a more adult direction. Ariana had less baggage than those two, who had to reintroduce themselves, but this really did feel like an effortless introduction. You'll Never Know is a song that Ari said that she would have released as a single if she could go back in time, and I agree, this one's an underrated jam. The layered vocals, the hook, the vibes, it's 90s perfection. It's a very sassy, sharp track about putting a lover back in his place. It contains some of the best vocals on the record, and even ends with a fade out, which is such a beautiful small detail. Almost is Never Enough is cute, but definitely amongst my bottom two. It's well sung, and the chorus is a pretty solid showcase of Ari's vocals, but compared to the rest of the record, it's a bit of a snooze. It's kind of ironic that she had been dating Nathan Sykes when the song dropped, and they broke up pretty shortly after. Sykes was part of The Wanted, which was sort of the second fiddle boy band to 1D at the time. He's fine on the track, but Ari carries it. My other bottom two track has to be Popular Song, which is cute, but it really sounds out of place. Its production is one of the only ones on this record to really have a guitar rift and the sort of anthemic, upbeat pop that was popular at the time. The song's message is cute, but it doesn't really showcase Ari all that well other than her verse, and it is Mika's song. I would have personally switched this out for Voodoo. Voodoo Love or Pink Champagne, two demos from this era that definitely deserved a spot on the record. The final track is Better Left Unsaid, which I found to be a bit jarring, but a clever way to end the album. Ariana's vocals on this one are stunning. I mean, the rest of the record's stunning, but this one's a really good one. The subject of the song is devastating, but the random switch up to a beat drop always gets me by surprise. I've learned to love it because I think it's really ironic to have a guy yell, if you want to party, throw your hands up while Ari's singing about, like, romantic regret. It's kind of camp. It's kind of funny because I feel like this track foreshadowed Ari's slow switch to more conventional pop sounds on her blockbuster follow-up, My Ever. Everything, which is a whole different video. Looking back, yours truly was a well-executed and charming debut that definitely built the foundations for Grande's stellar career so far. It's still a record I find myself re-listening to sometimes. There's a couple of gems on here that stand tall with her later and greater hits. I always felt like Positions was a sister record to this album, a marked return to the R&B genre that she's really become a staple in. I'm happy to rate this record an 8.4 out of 10, a really strong score for a debut. 
And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in to the first video in my Ariana Grande series. I will be doing a bunch of other 10 year retrospectives pretty soon. A quick shout out to my members, my subscribers, anyone who watched this video, like, subscribe, comment your favorite track below. I love discussing music with you guys. That's why I make these videos. Anyway, I'll see you next video.